All right. Um, well, thanks everyone uh, for joining on time. Uh, my name is Lucas Otomoro. I'm head of research here at Into the Block. Uh, and today I'll be talking about uh, the Bitcoin mining migration. Um, first things first, uh, here's the agenda. Actually, before that, a uh, couple of pointers. Uh, we will be recording the webinar. So in case um, you're not able to stay for the whole duration or if you want to share it after, uh, we will be posting it in our YouTube page. Um, so tomorrow. Um, and as well, if you have any questions, especially if they're uh, regarding a particular slide, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A here. I have it on my other screen. So I'll be looking, keeping a close eye at it. Um, and I'll be answering questions as we go. Uh, and as well as having a, a full Q&A at the end. And well, uh, regarding today's uh, webinar, uh, first off, I'll give a quick overview just to make sure we're all on the same page regarding the uh, how Bitcoin mining works and the recent uh, Chinese uh, cryptocurrency mining ban. And finally, uh, I'll do a deep dive into the effects it has on multiple um, layers of Bitcoin. Uh, going from miners to security to decentralization, environmental concerns, and finally, of course, uh, markets and price. Uh, before that, though, uh, as per usual, a uh, quick update uh, about Into the Block. Uh, you might have seen uh, some activity from us uh, if you're in, in our uh, email newsfeed um, or follow us on social media. Uh, we released um, a new section on Curve Analytics uh, for like dive deep into the protocol metrics, as well as a, a in-depth report of how those work in that article. Um, we also released um, new indicators on fees. So tracking the total uh, and average transaction fees across layer one blockchains, such as Bitcoin, of course. Um, and finally, uh, very relevant for today, uh, we released a new section of mining indicators um, so 10 new indicators here, and, and of course today I'll be uh, touching on these and how you can use them to understand uh, not only what happened um, with the recent Chinese mining migration, but in general how they can be applied to uh, layer one protocols, uh, blockchains that use proof of work. Um, on the partnership side, we've also announced a couple of major partnerships with uh, Mexico Mexican Exchange and PDAX and the Filipino one. Uh, we continue to expand and we have uh, a lot more uh, exciting partnerships and releases to come uh, throughout the next quarter. All right, so uh, let's get started then. Uh, just to get everyone up to speed, um, Bitcoin mining consists on uh, a set of what would so-called miners uh, validating transactions uh, through a consensus algorithm known as proof of work. Uh, what this enables is uh, make sure that the transactions are verified uh, in a decentralized manner uh, across the globe um, so that verifying that it's immutable, uh, meaning that it can be changed, it can be tampered, and assuring the security for the network uh, in a decentralized way. Uh, another interesting point uh, about proof of work is that since the miners have to uh, recurringly sell to cover their costs, uh, they also um, allow, they enable the decentralization of the holdings, uh, which is something uh, less apparent, at least in proof of stake. And, and this happens because with, as they sell over time, they essentially end up uh, distributing uh, Bitcoin in this case um, throughout the world across multiple holders, rather than just having them uh, stack all the Bitcoin. Uh, at the moment, uh, there's a block reward of 6.25 Bitcoin, which is rewarded to the miner uh, or mining pool that uh, mines, um, that essentially solves the cryptographic problem called SHA-256, validating a transaction block. They receive 6.25 Bitcoin for doing so, uh, in order to incentivize uh, miners, of course. Uh, and as many will know, uh, the rewards uh, have uh, every 210,000 blocks, more commonly referred to as every four years, even though it's not exactly uh, the case. Uh, and yes, this is a supply distribution um, with the halvings happening uh, roughly every four years. And, and of course, um, Bitcoin's uh, yearly, well, issuance uh, gets 
cut every four years, making it uh, um, allegedly more scarce every time. Um, key characteristics that are um, essentially propelled by miners are that uh, they allow the blockchain to be mutable, uh, securing all transactions and verifying the ledger. Um, in order for to, to verify that the chain um, is the correct one, essentially the blockchain that stands is the one that has the longest uh, history of transactions and those can't be tampered with. So that's the immutability. Uh, another key characteristic is that it, they enable uh, Bitcoin censorship resistance. Uh, they do so by being uh, globally dispersed throughout the world um, and essentially uh, propelling a, a decentralized network, as many uh, know, uh, in what's called the blockchain. Uh, they do so in an open and transparent manner, uh, which is, uh, well, uh, very beneficial. And because anyone can uh, run a node and uh, validate the transactions uh, like we do at into the block uh, and it's provably scarce um, <clears throat> because uh, we can verify the total supply and the issuance uh, and it has not changed so it's it's very uh, predictable in that sense and uh, it's one of the properties that why they call bitcoin uh, hard money in a way um, and another key metric related to this is, as many will know, the hash rate, uh, which aggregates the total computational power from all miners. Essentially, the greater the hash rate, the greater the security. Uh, this is the case because um, when the hash rate, when there's more computational power backing a network, uh, attempting to take over 51% uh, of the blockchain uh, requires more resources, which therefore make it more costly to attack. Um, Hence, if, if the hash rate is higher, it's more costly and to, to attempt to attack it and, there, and more secure. Um, and uh, as I'll talk, uh, the hash rate varies uh, based on multiple factors. One being Bitcoin price, two, the block rewards, uh, three, the network difficulty, as well as, uh, in this case, exogenous factors uh, such as uh, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin mining ban in China. All right, um, now let's get started uh, talking about what specifically happened in this case. Uh, it took me some time, but I, I managed to do a timeline here of uh, the order of things um, and on what happened regarding the Bitcoin mining migration. Um, essentially, it started uh, in mid-May, in May 18. Uh, first off, it sounded like just old news with China reiterating um, with their self-regulatory agencies reiterating a ban that companies weren't able to provide crypto services neither to its users nor as um, to accept payments in crypto as well as finally a, a ban on ICOs which although less relevant they, they did reiterate that caused a bit of a, a panic in the market even though it was pretty much old news um, but as things progressed, of course, uh, they started uh, being playing out differently. Um, first, with uh, in May 21, the Chinese vice premier um, announcing um, the first notice of a crackdown that mining was targeted uh, this time, in, in, which hadn't been in the past. Uh, and as many know, uh, Bitcoin mining used to be uh, over 50% uh, located, over 50% of the hash rate in China. Um, so that was the first notice and that started spooking uh, both miners and the market. Then on May 25, Inner Mongolia, which had the highest mining um, um, distribution uh, out of the whole hash rate on any region in China, announced uh, the first measures on a mining ban uh, were being discussed and they were set to begin on June as, as they end up happening. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, Emmanuel is asking, I want to request if I can get a soft copy to read because I'm faced with network downtime at the moment. Thanks. Uh, hi, Emmanuel. Uh, I believe we're, we're recording this. So when we post this, we, we of course can't give you a live uh, uh, written copy of what I'm saying. Uh, but as we record it and post it on our YouTube, uh, you should be able to uh, read it later. Uh, hopefully you can still take advantage of the nodes in the screen. Um, all right, I'll carry on. Uh, 
following the Inner Mongolia ban, uh, the Chinese government also started taking measures on exchanges uh, with Huobi and um, I believe OKX no longer being searchable terms on the search engines Baidu and Weibo, uh, as well as uh, leverage being limited and uh, derivatives being taken down for Chinese traders. Um, then uh, in June, uh, other regions such as Xinjiang and Yunnan ordered miners to stop. Uh, I believe so far all of these three regions uh, were initially coal powered, so there were um, a lot of uh, concerns that uh, this might be due to the emissions uh, required by well for use for Bitcoin mining. But then uh, the other region, Sichuan, also ordered miners to stop. And this was mainly a uh, uh, hydroelectric powered region, which uh, brought a lot of questions for people and it, it continued to extend. So this brings a lot of questions if it's uh, because of environmental concerns or what's the actual reasoning behind uh, the, the mining ban. Uh, of course, uh, the Chinese uh, government wasn't fully transparent about uh, the main reasons behind it. They just claim it's to protect consumers. Um, but it's, it's unclear how mining, uh, moving mining is actually protecting consumers uh, where, while they're still allowed to, uh, although it's, it's difficult since institutions are banned to, but the individuals at the individual level are still allowed to transact uh, in Bitcoin uh, as well as other cryptocurrencies. What's uh, more likely to be a, a factor here rather than um, mining itself than, rather than environmental concerns is that the, the Chinese government is developing a central bank uh, digital currency. They have been doing so for the past few years. Uh, and there's uh, potential reasons that point to a concern here, uh, mostly because as many know, uh, the Chinese government is an authoritarian government, which means uh, a lot of uh, their measures are imposed top down, whereas something like Bitcoin is decentralized and much more bottom up. Uh, where people all over the globe can contribute to the network uh, without any central point of authority. Uh, so in my opinion, it, it most likely has to do more with that conflict rather than consumer protection. Uh, but that's just my opinion, at least. Uh, and of course, uh, people that have been in this space for, for a while will realize uh, there are some similarities uh, versus previous uh, Bitcoin bans, uh, crypto bans, uh, hence the meme. Um, so there were previous bans in 2013 and 2017, uh, although they did reiterate uh, previous measures against institutions uh, and ICOs, the mining measures are completely new. Uh, so there was a bit of a difference previous to mining, uh, to previous uh, mining bans, crypto bans, sorry. Um, and again, uh, there's also the similarity that they weren't fully transparent uh, about the reasons behind it. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it doesn't matter because these, um, these policies uh, took place and effectively um, miners uh, had to migrate from China, dispersing globally, um, as I'll talk uh, in the next few slides. All right, so I'll be talking about the impact of the Chinese mining migration in five main sectors, uh, let's call them. <clears throat> so one is on miners themselves. Uh, second, I'll be talking about uh, the impacts on network security, uh, decentralization, uh, their the Bitcoin's environmental footprint, and finally on markets and prices, which of course are uh, a big part of crypto markets, of, of crypto space. I'm getting another question here. Um, okay, I can't seem to see it. One second. Uh, so Saurabh is asking, did Inner Mongolian miners had highest hash rate in the world? Well, uh, Inner Mongolia had the highest hash rate within China and China had the high, highest hash rate in the world. So, so it's it's not like the region had more hash rate than the rest of the world but it did have the highest share of the highest country making it one of the most prominent regions for bitcoin mining um 
then Manuel is asking, do you think the attacks on Binance are also related to that? Um, well, in, in, from what I've, at, for, according to my knowledge, uh, the attacks on Binance, or well, the regulations against Binance have been coming from uh, mostly European countries and Canada. So like the UK, Italy or Spain uh, and Canada. So most likely it has, in my opinion, nothing to do uh, with uh, Bitcoin mining or like an authoritarian stance. Uh, in my opinion, it does have to do more with uh, excess leverage. And there's some rumors that it might have to do with uh, stocks that they listed and which are of course securities. So those are likely to be a bigger factor than uh, what the Chinese government had in mind, uh, whatever those reasons were. All right, uh, let's carry on. Um, I'll, I'll start with the effects on miners. Um, uh, one more question, sorry guys. Uh, Anonymous is telling, uh, yeah, uh, that I prefer to finish the presentation before answering more questions. Uh, good thing that you interrupted me to, to, to mention that. Uh, I'll keep that in mind. If, if more questions like the one on near Mongolia is, is regarding a specific slide, I'll be happy to go back to the slide. But yeah, uh, we will have a Q&A at the end. So if, if it's just a random question, I won't dive into it and I'll just carry on from now on. Um, all right, so effects on miners. Uh, as many that follow crypto closely, uh, hash rate dropped significantly uh, initially as price started to drop and then even further here in June um, as uh, the mining ban on China started getting imposed. Um, and what that meant, even though it might not be fully obvious at first, is that uh, mining Bitcoin became uh, more profitable. So that is the case because as there's less uh, computational power um, to mine Bitcoin, even though uh, Bitcoin price dropped, for instance, I think it's like 55%, the hash rate dropped even further. So uh, there's less competition, uh, which then brought the network difficulty down, as, as I'll mention briefly. And uh, we see here in a chart here from our Capital Markets Insights that, um, that the shares in, in Marathon and Riot, which are two uh, mining companies uh, based out of the US, uh, had their shares grow uh, 30 and 40% respectively uh, throughout June while uh, Bitcoin uh, dropped, it was already going sideways at that moment, uh, 4%. So we see that since the measures started taking place in mid to late May, um, well, more real, realistically in, in June, that uh, these two started diverging, uh, the performance of mining corporations and Bitcoin. And that is essentially the, the market pricing in that American miners uh, have higher hash rate share and therefore uh, higher odds of mining Bitcoin and therefore uh, greater profits. Um, effects on network security. Um, so as I mentioned, hash rate dropped nearly 70%. And what this means, uh, referring to my previous um, explanation of the hash rate, is that it became uh, cheaper to attempt to attack the blockchain. This is because it would require less resources if one were to attempt to get a 51% uh, share of the hash rate and do what's the, the so-called 51% uh, attack. Uh, however, even though this may sound uh, concerning at first, um, the reality is it's still prohibitively expensive to get 51% of the hash rate. Uh, keep in mind that even after the drop, Bitcoin mining still consumes more energy than most countries. So it's still uh, quite prohibitively expensive and to make things even um, more expensive, uh, chips, uh, there's a global chip shortage, uh, as many will know, uh, affecting both um, semiconductors to even car companies. Um, so uh, accessing chips for um, Bitcoin mining equipment was already scarce before this. Uh, therefore, um, it, was, it would be prohibitively expensive if someone starts to buy more and more uh, mining equipment trying to attempt a 51% attack. Um, so in reality, it didn't get to uh, materialize in any serious network issues, security issues. And uh, finally, 
uh, Bitcoin does have incentives to uh, in place set to restore their security. Uh, and these are the incentives. So Bitcoin um, hash rate and network difficulty, uh, as well as average uh, time between transactions, uh, the so-called block time, these all three work together. And the way that it happens is that network difficulty adjusts based on the competition to mine uh, Bitcoin, targeting a block time of 10 minutes. So we see here as the, um, as the Bitcoin, as the mining um, measures started to be implemented in June, that the block time, so the average time between transactions uh, skyrocketed as more miners uh, went off the network, uh, making things less, uh, less secure. Uh, and therefore in reaction to that, we see this massive drop in, in July uh, of network difficulty of, of nearly 30%. And it, it, the, the incentives uh, worked. So as it became uh, significantly less uh, difficult to mine Bitcoin, we see uh, that the block time reverses and starts falling down back to the target level of around 10 minutes. Uh, so this is great. Uh, it shows that uh, the resilience of the Bitcoin blockchain and how the, these levers um, are able to keep in place a set of incentives that uh, brought back um, the security of the network. Um, and of course, uh, we see this affecting hash rate itself. Uh, even slightly before uh, the difficulty drop, of course, a lot of news uh, pieces in, in the crypto space were covering the anticipation of the mining drop, of the difficulty drop. So it already started increasing before in anticipation. And we see that hash rate has already bounced uh, 90% uh, from its low set in the 27th of June. Uh, now moving forward to the effects on decentralization. Uh, as I mentioned before, 50% of the hash rate used to be based in China. Uh, that is no longer the case. There may be a few miners, now rogue miners that are not um, fully backed by the government right now or fully compliant with the government uh, measures. But the reality is uh, most of the miners that used to be in China migrated elsewhere. Uh, the main two countries uh, that have benefited from this are the USA uh, and Kazakhstan, uh, which is conveniently located uh, close to China. So we see the dispersion between these two countries and, of course, other countries as well. And what that means is that now that there is less than 50% of hash rate in one uh, central location, there's a significantly less risk um, of one country taking measures against the Bitcoin network. Uh, so there were conspiracy theories, uh, to call them that way, uh, of saying that the Chinese controlled uh, crypto and that was like an ongoing concern for a lot of people. Uh, those concerns are vanished really after this. Uh, they do not contain, uh, control the hash rate anymore, um, well the majority of it anyways. Uh, and now that it's uh, globally dispersed, uh, it's more resilient, uh, it's, it's more censorship resistance, which of course is a key factor uh, for the Bitcoin blockchain. And therefore uh, it's less risky for any one single country to attempt to take over uh, the blockchain. Uh, and we see this, uh, this patterns reflected in mining pools. Um, so for those of you that are not fully familiar, uh, mining pools are um, as the name implies, uh, pools of shared resources <clears throat> where miners uh, all around the globe uh, add or join, uh, join a pool. And therefore, if, if I'm a, I don't know, a, a lonely miner in Venezuela and I don't have enough resources or enough odds for me to be the, the miner getting each, mining each Bitcoin block, I contribute my resources to a pool of miners uh, and I get my pro rata share of the rewards that are earned. Uh, in other words, if, if, I'm, uh, if I'm contributing 5% of the hash rate to that pool, I obtain 5% of the rewards of that pool. And we see here that uh, pools, mining pools that have a high influence in China, such as Huobi and Binance, uh, which of course are based there, we see their mining pools dropped 
uh, throughout uh, year to date, they've dropped two thirds, nearly two thirds in Huobi's case and 35% in Binance. And we see this interesting pattern that independent miners, uh, which we label as unknown and into the block, uh, increase uh, over 30,000% year to date. So these are miners that don't belong to a mining pool in particular, and they opt to do it independently instead. Uh, so it's, it's quite interesting uh, to see this spike, um, especially since the mining um, uh, regulations started taking place in China. Uh, I'd be remiss uh, in this conversation if I didn't touch the topic of um, energy consumption. And the reality is, it's quite high. Uh, Bitcoin consumes more uh, electricity. Uh, this is based on data of the University of Cambridge. Consumes more electricity uh, than most countries. Uh, just over what Colombia and Bangladesh uh, consume on a yearly basis. Uh, and of course, uh, this brought a lot of concerns uh, with Elon Musk uh, notoriously uh, batching and cancelling uh, Bitcoin transactions for Tesla. Uh, which brought a lot of uh, meme attention uh, within Redditors. And while I, I don't think the, the Bitcoin price uh, had to do too much with uh, solely Elon Musk's tweets, uh, it, it came out as a scapegoat uh, when the reality is we had been in an overextended market. Uh, but that's a topic for another day. Uh, regardless, the reality is environmental concerns on a global basis uh, are increasingly important. So we see here Google trends uh, worldwide for ESG, environmental, social, and governance uh, have been uh, near all-time highs. But uh, when put into context, I'd argue that people like to hate on Bitcoin's energy consumption because they don't see the value behind it. Um, it consumes, even though it's quite high in comparison to countries, 0.06% uh, of the global energy consumption share. This is again data of the University of Cambridge and it consumes a lot less electricity than for instance air conditioning or uh, a lot of household appliances uh, which of course are easier to resonate with your average consumer uh, but the reality is even though it consumes a lot of electricity when put into context it's not that high. Um, and how was the uh, Bitcoin affected by this? Well, assuming that, um, that the energy consumption uh, source for miners stays the same, uh, a decreasing hash rate, all things, all other things being equal, leads to less energy consumption. However, as, as I mentioned before, uh, most of the regions in China mining Bitcoin were coal powered. So this theoretically would lead to a potentially more uh, environmentally friendly uh, distribution of um, Bitcoin mining, even though it really depends on where that Bitcoin mining ended up being distributed. So it, we can't tell for sure because there's lack of transparency in miners energy sources. This also brought to uh, the creation of the Bitcoin mining council between Michael Saylor, Elon Musk, and I believe uh, some American miners, which plead to be more transparent on this. Uh, the reality, though, is that this is still uh, uncertain, um, but it's potentially promising, as, as Elon himself would claim. Um, finally, uh, what are the effects on markets and price? Uh, well, the reality is that moving mining equipment uh, is very expensive process. Um, so shipping it overseas, having to uh, decide to sell the equipment or, or not. Uh, setting up a place, the infrastructure, it's, it's a costly process. So therefore, uh, it's no surprise that miners have opted to diminish their mining reserves as this happened. So we see Bitcoin mining reserves uh, dropped over 100,000 from its highs in, in May 18, May 19, right before the mining migration, the mining crackdown occurred. So uh, this also reflects in the outflows from minor addresses, which spiked uh, just as the first when the Chinese reiterated the, um, the previous bans and more when the bans started taking effect in Chinese regions. Uh, and this is shown with a net, with a net decrease in, in their activity. Uh, these are of course, some of our new indicators 
uh, and they can be used to track this impact from, from miners and exogenous effects like this. Uh, when put into context, though, similarly, like I did with environmental concerns, the reality is miners represent a small fraction of total volume. Um, so it's been diminishing over time, of course, as the block rewards get smaller and smaller. <laughs> so just over 3%, I believe, of the volume comes from minor addresses. And a, what this is called the minor flows volume share. And this is a great metric to put that into context. Uh, so even though uh, it does sound like a lot, 100,000 Bitcoin and whatnot, the reality is the selling pressure might have been overstated since, um, as I mentioned, just 3% of the daily on-chain volume uh, is coming from, on -chain, from minor addresses. And minor rewards, which are, of course, a fraction of uh, total minor activity, are even smaller. So uh, this is also one of the reasons why it sucks to flow doesn't really make too much sense uh, because minor rewards represent and inflation uh, therefore only represent about 0.06% of the total volume. The reality is that the main selling pressure comes from um, the markets and traders, not from miners. So uh, miners in terms of price uh, continue to be more and more irrelevant uh, just in their selling pressure. However, their service in terms of protecting their, the network continues to be at the core of Bitcoin blockchain. To conclude, uh, this has been one of the most impactful events in the history of Bitcoin. <clears throat> it has led to a potentially lower environmental footprint for Bitcoin. And hopefully over the past, uh, over the next couple of months, uh, we'll be able to get more data on exactly how it's distributed. Uh, this is something we're looking at uh, into the block. And of course, multiple other sources are keeping an eye on. Uh, miners during this stage uh, did have some sudden pressure in the um, in Bitcoin, but it's likely that the concerns of uh, the mining migration might have been overstated in terms of uh, selling pressure, at least. And it leaves us with this paradox of Bitcoin being simultaneously less and more secure. Um, essentially, the lower hash rate, as I uh, discussed, made it uh, for a brief moment, uh, less costly to attempt uh, to attack uh, Bitcoin, or at least to attempt to, but it led to a global uh, dispersion of uh, Bitcoin mining, uh, which, as I mentioned, makes it a lot more censorship resistant and more resilient and decentralized. Uh, thanks, everyone. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. Uh, the next webinar, I'll be diving into decentralized exchanges course one of the most exciting uh, spaces uh, within crypto they've increased from uh, hundreds of thousands of volumes to billions a day um, I'll appreciate if you guys sign up uh, our team will be sending the link here in the chat or Q&A so make sure to sign up uh, and now stay here uh, for the next few minutes uh, answering questions okay so I see some here already uh, give me a second. Uh, Vano is asking if could those unknowns be private mining pools? Uh, so from our algorithms, let me go to the slide. Here it is. So we actually differentiate uh, between small mining pools. So you can see when these resources are being shared or pooled. Uh, so you can identify uh, private mining pools, um, which are defined under others uh, in our data. And unknown are uh, simply um, independent miners. So if you go back here, I'm, I'm just focusing on year to date or last year, sorry. Uh, so the unknown miners does not include that, but previously Satoshi uh, was included under another small CPU miners were included under unknown before mining pools were a thing. Uh, Manuel is asking, what do you think about the adoption of BTC in El Salvador and the plans to mine BTC with geothermal generated energy? Yeah, so it's, it's a great uh, progress, of course, for Bitcoin to be as accepted as legal tender in El Salvador. And uh, I'm loving the memes on volcano powered Bitcoin. Uh, the reality though is it's a small country. Uh, so I, I don't, 
um, even though I'm very bullish on the incentives that it generates, and this is not financial advice, of course, uh, it creates the game theoretic incentives for people to migrate there and more activity to go into El Salvador and then benefit, which then leads to more developing countries to look at it uh, and be tempted at least to um, adopt Bitcoin as legal tender in order to also benefit from the increased in investment and attention, uh, like we've seen other Latin American countries like Paraguay, Mexico. Um, this creates a, a very good incentive, but I think the geothermal um, generated uh, Bitcoin is likely to play a much smaller role than uh, at least within El Salvador, which is a very small country than the impact and the game theoretic incentives behind the legal tender um, um, agreement or uh, I forgot what's the word. A um, couple more questions. Uh, Luke saying, is the exodus of miners from China to other low cost energy countries like Middle East or Southeast Asia not more damaging to the environment than regulation would have been? Yeah, look, it's, it's a great uh, subject. Uh, data so far from miners themselves uh, is showing that they, I'm looking for the slide, uh, that miners di were distributed between, uh, they, they migrated to the US and, and um, uh, Kazakhstan for the most part. So it's very likely uh, that the distribution of energy in, in Kazakhstan uh, at least to my knowledge, it's not environmentally friendly, it's more low cost. Um, so it, it's still unclear on whether uh, that share ended up in places that are more or less environmentally friendly. There are sources claiming both things. So I'm, I'm just saying it's uncertain. However, uh, Chinese uh, Bitcoin mining came mostly from um, coal powered regions, uh, Inner Mongolia being the largest. And just from that and the decrease in hash rate, we're seeing less energy consumption, uh, at least at the moment. And of course, over the next few months, uh, there should be more uh, clarity on how that Bitcoin ended up, uh, Bitcoin mining resources ended up being distributed, which is why, therefore, uh, I, I put this as my conclusion for ESG that it's uncertain, but still potentially promising. Uh, Anonymous is saying regarding the miners, miners equipment in China likely to be redeployed outside of China, which is to say the hash rate might recover relatively quickly, or will that equipment be taken mostly off the market? So new equipment will replace the hash rate, which will take longer. And ultimately, uh, none of this matters much because of the capacity self correcting anyway, right? So it is possible, if I'm getting your long question uh, correctly, it is possible that some of the hash rate might have been taking off uh, short term, uh, waiting for new equipment to be released. But as you mentioned, uh, these, uh, these um, variables are self-correcting because they have incentives in place uh, that make it um, such that the hash rate um, and incentivizes more miners to join. Um, as I mentioned in this slide on how the network difficulty adjusts based on the average transaction, uh, average time between transactions, which already led to a correction, well, the opposite of correction, and um, reversion towards the mean uh, in the amount of uh, hash rate and therefore making the network more secure. All right. I see uh, a lot of uh, thank yous. Uh, I, I thank you guys for taking the time to be here. Uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, make sure to sign up for the next webinar. I uh, appreciate everyone's time and hope you all have a great day. Thank you uh, and stay safe everyone.